All right, hello. This is Ryan recording uh, the fourth session of Conline with me here. Um, this will be the second one that's available to watch on my channel. Um, so, um, I'm here. Uh, what you're seeing now on the screen is my agenda that I've kind of updated the look of a bit. Um, let me actually reposition this a little bit um, just so we can see things better. I'm going to make the view a bit bigger. There we go. There we go. Tweak it a little bit. And there we are. Okay, cool. So, um, I'm going to start with addressing some questions that I got between last time and this time uh, streaming. I would also like to uh, do a review of what's been done so far again. Um, so I'm going to um, just wait a second to finish up preparing stuff real quick. There's a few last things I need to set up. Um, but then I'll go ahead and uh, start answering questions. Um, and um, this stream is set to go for about two and a half hours. I haven't been saying that thus far, but um, like the time that these will be running, but today it's going to be from um, uh, 5 to 7.30 uh, Pacific, uh, 5 to 7.30 p.m. Pacific. Sorry about that, just getting things set up here. Um, I'm still a bit new to using OBS and Twitch, um, so apologies for that. Um, all right, so, um, oh no, sorry, gotta fix something real quick. You're not seeing everything I'm seeing right now, but um, yeah, I'll go ahead and start talking while I'm getting things set up um, for the stream. So I got a couple questions um, between the last stream, which was on Saturday and today. Um, so I wanted to answer those. And these are just general questions about what I'm doing with Conlang with me. Um, if you have any specific questions about any linguistic stuff or Conlanging stuff I bring up as we go, or eventually when we get into other humanities stuff that's going to come up with these um, this conlang, you can ask stuff too if I happen to know about it. Um, but anyway, if you have any questions as we go, feel free to ask them in the stream. I'm keeping an eye on the chat um, just to see if anyone has questions. And um, I'm going to try to also make sure that my screen isn't too zoomed in because I think the view might be a bit different on desktop as opposed to um, uh, other views here. Um, so I'm just going to make sure everything's as it should be. Let's see here. Okay. So, I'm going to start with answering questions. And the first question I had was, um, what kind of conlang is this? Um, 
And I wasn't entirely sure how to interpret that question because there's that could mean a few different things. So I'm just going to answer it as comprehensively as I possibly can. Um, so when we're talking about kinds of conlangs, there are some different ways to categorize the kind of conlang that you're making. And the um, uh, first way I'm going to talk about is what type of goal or types of goals, plural, do you have in making the conlang and how does that affect the construction of the constructed language in question? Um, so there are sort of three general categories that conlangs tend to fall into. I might open up a temporary folder or sheet just to demonstrate here. Um, so first time, uh, the first kind of conlang I'm going to talk about is an auxiliary conlang. Um, uh, these are usually abbreviated to auxlangs. Um, most conlangs are abbreviated with some kind of portmanteau with the word lang. So I'm just going to call this an auxlang. Um, and auxlangs, um, it's the name would suggest auxiliary it means it's there to help. It's to facilitate something. And um, typically these are designed with the goal of uh, being an intermediary language between speakers of different languages. Uh, so, for example, um, I'm actually going to zoom out just a bit because I think I might be a little too zoomed in here. Um, there we go. Um, actually, I think we were fine, honestly. Things just look a little bit different on my view of things. Um, Sorry about that. And okay, that should be fine. It's back to where we were, I think. <laughs> um, so uh, auxiliary languages are usually designed with the purpose to f be intermediary languages between different speakers of different languages. Um, so their main design goal is to be a good language to mediate between different people from different cultures. And so some sub goals that tend to come up with that are ease of learning. You want different people from different linguistic backgrounds to be able to learn it relatively easily and um, uh, recognizability is another uh, sub goal that often comes up. Uh, people from different linguistic backgrounds recognize the words. So words will tend to be sort of geared towards international um, words for things. So if there's a word for something that many languages tend to have the same word for, they will kind of opt for that, that form of the word. And the grammar of these languages tends to try to be as simple, quote unquote simple, as possible. Um, but what is simple really often depends on what language the person is coming from. So that can be a challenge for auxlangs. Um, uh, some really famous auxlangs include Esperanto um, and Edo. Um, those are some really well-known ones. Uh, and um, so that's one kind of conlang. Uh, languages that are made to be sort of in between languages for people of different backgrounds to use with each other. So if they don't have if they don't speak the same native language, they might speak the same auxlang. That's kind of the idea with an auxlang. Um, and there are sort of different gradients of this. So um, some aim to be completely international um, and worldwide. Others tend to just be a specific region. So you might have, say, um, a conlang that's meant to be spoken between different speakers of Slavic languages. So that there is a language called Inter-Slavic that is an auxlang between Slavic languages. Um, there are a lot of auxlangs that are meant to be used between Romance language speakers. Um, and auxlangs in general tend to have like a European bias. So um, that is something that some more recent conlangs have tried to push against um, in the auxlang sphere. But uh, there are a lot of challenges with making an auxlang. Um, so that's, that's the first kind of conlang. Um, then we also have, um, and I'll explain why I'm positioning these the way I am in a bit. Uh, then we have what are called engelangs. 
and Zhuangs. Whether or not you spell it with a second E depends on the person, <laughs> in my experience. Um, but what it's short for is engineered language. And Englangs are made with a specific technical goal in mind. Um, so there's going to be a goal with an Englang that is going to de drive the different grammatical and um, word choices that you end up making in the language towards your specific goal. Um, so any anytime you have like a stated technical goal that you want to achieve, other than something super vague like aesthetically pleasing or elegant, um, those things are very subjective, um, or sounds naturalistic, that could be a little bit less subjective because you can look at what natural languages do, but natural languages do a lot of things. Like, actual spoken languages in the world do a lot of weird things, so what is and is naturalistic? Really, really, it's a wide, <laughs> there's a wide array of things that can be considered naturalistic. Um, so, if it's a goal that's a little bit more specific than that, that's more, those are more sort of subjective goals. But if your goal is specific, like I want a conlang that will um, exemplify a particular way of seeing the world. Um, so that would be called a philosophical language. That's kind of a subtype of engineer language. You're engineering the language to exemplify and push the speaker to think or express themselves in a way in line with a philosophy. Um, Ladan is an example of a philosophical language. It was designed with the purpose of um, allowing women to express themselves more authentically. Um, it was created by Suzette Elgin in her um, native tongue sci-fi series. Um, then we have um, uh, loglings or lodgelings, um, spelled L-O-G-L-A-N-G. Um, and these are meant to uh, follow formal logic. So they're conlangs that are designed to emulate or be structured in the way that um, programming languages tend to be structured in. Um, so Lojban is probably the best known and most widely used of these, this kind of conlang. So um, that is an englang. Uh, then we have um, let's see here. Um, the third kind of conlang, um, with this sort of way of seeing conlangs based on goal, which is, um, artlangs. Um, I just noticed I made this one plural, but the other two singular, so I'm gonna make them all singular. Alright, um, so an artlang is also what it sounds like. It stands for artistic language. And so it's a language made purely for artistic purposes. So this is just for fun. Um, there could be other sort of goals wrapped in um, an artlang. Um, and artlangs are also usually categorized into some smaller categories like englangs or. Um, so um, artlangs can be just simply personal, like a person made it because they wanted to make something that sounded aesthetically pleasing to them. Um, so that's one kind of art line. It's just a personal con line that they're making to sound nice and potentially use. Um, they can be a, um, a fictional language that is meant to be in, say, a fantasy book or a sci-fi book or something like that. So, um, for example, uh, Klingon in sort of like the Star Trek universe would be an example of an art line. Um, that's not necessarily a book, that's a show, but uh, things like Dothraki, uh, Valyrian, the Elvish languages that Tolkien made, um, those would all be uh, fictional art lines made for fictional universes. Um, so if people are designing a constructed world, maybe they're making a map, and they want to make a, like a culture in their fictional world, and they want it to have a language or multiple languages to fill up their world, then they would be making fictional art lines. Um, uh, a lot of, I know a lot of people who like engage with this for, um, role-playing games like D&D &D and stuff, they'll maybe use an, a fictional art lang 
for that kind of purpose if they have if they want if they're people in their party who want to speak multiple languages to sound make the gameplay more authentic and fun um and then there are alt langs um that's another kind of uh i would call that maybe a subcategory of fictional um basically alt langs are alternative history languages are languages that are made for um exploring what could have happened if something in history was different so um or just general hypotheticals i'll type alt lang as well just so you can see that alt lang so what if um there were a romance language spoken in um i don't know uh australia like some romans from ancient rome somehow ended up on us like in australia what language might that have looked like um so that would be an example of an alt language what if this you know this country conquered this country in the past or what if this historical event happened differently and how would that impact the language um so if someone's writing that kind of story or making a game with that kind of story they might engage in making an alt language so uh the reason i put these in a triangle is because there is a um a, there was a linguist, or um, a conlinger at least, I'm, I'm not sure if he was linguist, uh, Claudio, wow, I can type, Claudio Gnoli, uh, who in 1997 was making a conling called Viva, and noticed that these sort of traditional labels weren't entirely adequate for describing the language that he was making. So he made this sort of triangle that um, represents sort of the range that a language could be in, a conlang. Um, and so um, some people in the conlang community call this the Gnoli Triangle or Gnoli's Triangle. Um, and um, so you can kind of think about how strong is each goal, is the language primarily for artistic purposes, um, but maybe has some auxiliary purposes you want it to have as well. You might be kind of in this area here in between. Um, if you are making, you know, a, an engineered language, but you also care a lot about it sounding nice and just being a nice work of art as well. You might be in here, like in this in between. And if you have like a combination of the three, of course, you can like kind of end up somewhere in the middle. Now the question, what kind of conling is this, the one I'm making in this stream? Well, when you look at my goals, if we go back into overview, my primary goals were, um, I, I reworded some of this a little bit to be a little bit more specific. Um, oh, I have a typo here. Oh yeah, no I don't, never mind. <laughs> Detailed information is compact, there we go. So my three goals are I want to use the conlang to um, be particularly suited to take notes on or write about humanities and social sciences, mostly linguistics, anthropology, and folklore um, studies, uh, but these other things as well. So lots of history, anthropology, um, philological stuff, uh, and then probably also have some ability to talk about sociology, psychology, religious stuff, just anything, social sciences and humanities. That's kind of my focus um, with this language. So I have this goal, and it's going to drive my the, the construction of this language. So this sort of suited towards these things can be pretty subjective uh, to a degree, but I'm going to be thinking about particular things that would be useful in these fields as I'm going. So in that sense, with this sort of goal here, that would kind of land us more in the engineered um, area. But if we look at our, my other goals, let's see. So we have um, detailed information is compact. So I want detailed information about things um, to be relatively brief in terms of like how long words are and things like that. So um, I'm sort of engineering the language to be compact in a particular way. Um, so again, this is kind of a sub goal with this. I want detailed information about these things to be quote unquote efficient. Now efficient again is more of a an abstract goal. Um, you can't really quantify efficient as easily. Um, I could say something like a certain number of sounds per meaning or something like that if I wanted to go that in deep. But I don't want to do that because of the third goal, which is that I want it to be aesthetically pleasing to me. <laughs> um, 
uh, because aesthetically pleasing is inherently subjective. Um, and I would prefer to have things be a little bit more naturalistic. So I want to be able to look at this language written potentially in the Roman alphabet um, that I'm currently using um, and look like it could be an actual spoken language that would exist. Now, it probably won't have all the engineered features that I'm going to put into it if it were a natural language, unless you maybe imagine a hypothetical culture in a fictional language. If this were a fictional language, imagine a hypothetical culture where they for thousands and thousands of years have been very focused on these topics and their language has developed in such a way that it uses this. Even if that were the case, it would not be engineered as perfectly to these topics as it probably will end up in this conlang. So it won't be perfectly like a natural language, but I want to feel, I want it to feel if I'm speaking or writing in it, like it is a natural language to an extent. I want it to sound languagey which is a very vague idea, and it's very personal to me. As well as even this kind of more engineered goal of suitable to the social sciences and humanities, that even that is going to be highly subjective to me. And I intend to use this for personal use. At least that's the form I know I want it to take. Um, so that would kind of land me sort of in this area here. Um, like maybe maybe here like engelang but in an art langy direction like there's some personal and aesthetic choices i'm going to make that are particular to me what i find artistic because at the end of the day this is just for fun i don't need to use a conlang to write about the humanities i just would like to because that would be fun so that that kind of puts me maybe between these two columns here if i were to space this out more consistently <laughs> um i would probably be like where this border is now are there any elements of Oxling here? Um, I guess if it were hypothetically being used by multiple social scientists, <laughs> um, it might be helpful for communication between these people on these topics. But I don't really think that makes it an Oxling. They might have different first languages and use this as an in-between, but I don't actually foresee that happening in the real world. So um, I, I would say that there's not really an Oxling element at all to my conlang, but I would say it's more of an engineered language that's going to have some personal aesthetic qualities to it that are kind of idiosyncratic to me. And I think that's already clear with some of the choices I made, what I guess vibes with how I think about these topics, although these topics, um, these humanities and social science topics are definitely things that exist outside of my personal opinions, and I can look at, I, I'm in, indeed plan on looking at some outside um, paradigms and things that are going to help me make choices here. Um, at the end of the day, it is going to be biased towards my own perception of these topics, which is limited to my own point of view. So in that sense, it is still a personal language. So we're kind of in between engineered and personal. So that hopefully answers the question of what kind of language is this that I'm making that um, from a point of view of Cool. Now there's another way to think about what kind of language this is based on um, not goal but source or origin. Like where is this language coming from? Um, obviously it's coming from me. I'm making it. But in terms of the source of the words that I'm going to end up with, words and other grammatical forms, so far we don't have any. I've thought about things like, um, like noun cases, um, the different... Um, the different classes of nouns I'm going to have, the um, word order, the alignment we talked about a few times. Um, but in terms of like where is the language coming from, where are the words themselves going to come from? We don't have any of that. We don't know what the language is going to sound like or what the words, where the words will come from. So um, we do have some influences already um, on the grammar. Um, we have sort of an evidentiality system that kind of um, is loosely inspired by indirect evidentiality in Turkic languages, although it works a bit differently in this language, which I will explain when we do the overview, and, or I mean the, the review of the overview. Um, uh, we have a noun class system, which is slightly based on or inspired by, loosely inspired by the Bantu languages um, noun class system. And then I have a dative experience or construction I'm going to use that's 
inspired by what old Germanic languages do with verbs of perception and stuff. Um, we can go back over that again as well in the review. Um, but apart from just vague grammatical influences, the question of what kind of conlang this is um, would be um, could be answered by like what what source of language what, what's my source of the words and um, oh hello um, so um, when we're talking about source of language um, now that we're done talking about sort of goal um, art lang ox lang eng lang and we've kind of established this as an eng lang with some artistic and personal elements that are going to be involved. Um, we can talk about the source. And so these are generally categorized with some Latin terms. Uh, we have got a posteriori and a priori. Um, and these more specifically actually describe sources for words. Um, when we're talking about natural languages, whether something is borrowed um, from a um, from an, a, another language or derived um, diachronically, and I'll explain what diachronic means in just a moment. Um, in both cases, you're getting words and other forms from existing languages. Um, so a language exists, and then in the language, the conlang in this case that we're talking about. Um, the the word is getting borrowed or being derived um, diachronically from a source language and then a priori would just be the opposite of that um, so a priori means there's no source um, in the real world from a from a language that's spoken um, or even another conlang um, that is giving you these words you as the language inventor um, are coming up with them yourself from scratch. So you're making up the words entirely from scratch from your own um, imagination and creativity. Um, you might be influenced by existing words. You, things might end up accidentally bumping into existing things, or you might sneakily borrow some things but tweak them a bit. But um, for the most part, the words are coming from your own mind and not an existing language. Um, so if the question, going back to the question, it was, what kind of conlang is this? Um, I haven't decided yet. I don't think I'm ready yet to decide whether or not I want the language to be a posteriori or a priori. Um, I think I want to make that decision when I'm further along in just figuring out the grammar and how many things I want in the grammar. Then I can kind of step back and think, where do I want these to come from? How creative do I think I can be in making up all these words? How useful for my goal will it be to make up words versus to borrow them? Um, and do I want, I could of course end up with a mix of both. I could have some things come from my own brain and other things come from existing languages. So languages can, um, conlangs can kind of fall in between these categories or mix and match different approaches for different parts of the language. So um, that's a posteriori and a priori. Um, Another question is whether or not I want the language to be diachronic. So I'll explain what diachronic means. Diachronic means, um, if you break down the, the sort of roots, it's through time. And this is as opposed to synchronic, which is same time. Um, so a diachronic language is just a language where you are deriving it from a source rather than just borrowing. And when I say deriving, I mean putting the language or like the source of your words or your language through naturalistic processes of change. So you have say, let's say you want to make a diachronic a posteriori language that derives from Spanish. Let's say you're making an alt lang where you're imagining some Span Spanish people in the past or even the present colonized Mars. <laughs> and so you want to make a Martian language that derives from Spanish. So what you would do is you would take Spanish as it exists now, whatever dialect of Spanish you're going to use for, or dialects, plural, you're going to use as sort of the colonizers of Mars language originally, and then you're going to put it through changes. So there will be changes in 
pronunciation of certain things, certain sounds will systematically change in certain environments, and you might have some grammatical shifts and semantic shifts of meaning of certain words and phrases. Um, so that would be an example of a diachronic language. I also don't know if, if I want that yet. So these kinds of decisions I'm going to actually make further down the road um, because I don't know which approach would be the best for my goals yet. I want to think more about how my goals impact my grammar um, and then how they'll impact my lexicon. Um, and when I'm kind of getting to that point, then I'll think about what approach do I want to take? Do I want to just simply borrow from existing languages? Do I want to pick some ling a language or some languages and pretend they naturalistically, you know, merged with each other or developed into another language? Or do I want to have it all come from my brain? Hello, chat. Thank you for coming. I'm just explaining um, what kind of language I have. So I had the question, what kind of conlang am I making here? And first I talked about source, and I talked about why my language is technically what we call an engineered um, and personal. Um, whoa. Oh, it's a plus, so that's going to be like a formula symbol. I need to fix that. Um, personal. Um, conlang. So engineered meaning I have a specific goal that is kind of determining my choices grammatically um, and just in terms of the words and it's personal because I'm making some kind of idiosyncratic decisions just based on my own personal aesthetic or things that I will find useful or I will find easy. Um, so there's a lot of subjectivity involved so there is kind of an objective goal of I want it to be useful for you know humanities and social sciences um, but also and be detailed have detailed information about those things in a compact space those are kind of my sort of more objective parameters that makes this an engineered language and then um, but I want it to be aesthetically pleasing to me and I want it to kind of fit into my own way of thinking about these subjects which makes it also personal a personal artistic language so um, Um, that hopefully answers the question I got about, um, features. Um, oh, I had a question. A uh, question in the chat. Okay. Um, easy derivation between pieces of, um, oh yes, this abbreviation. Let, let me re go over this again. Uh, I was going to do this in the review. Um, actually, yeah, I'll just wait until we get to review. I'll explain what that, <laughs> that, um, acronym is. I'll just say it's part of speech. It's just an unfortunate coincidence that it is P-O-S. So, um, so, for example, you can have a verb and easily make it into a noun and vice versa. Um, point of sale. That also <laughs> is not what this is. But yeah, a good, good catch with that um, abbreviation. Yeah. Um, it's always of in the middle, too. Uh, which is fun. So... Um, the other way, so I, first I talked about just going over my answer to the first question, what kind of language is this? It's an engineered personal conlang. This describes the goal of the language. I'm engineering it towards a particular goal, but also it's going to be conducive to my own aesthetic tastes and use of, or like, you, in, um, interaction with or engagement with the topics at hand, um, humanities and social sciences. And then the other half of what kind of language this is, is what is the source of my words? Is it, you know, borrowed from existing words and existing languages, derived from them naturalistically as if it evolved from them, which would be sort of a diachronic approach going through time, as if, like, you start with, I don't know, let's say I'm borrowing it from Polish, and I'm putting Polish through sound changes to make it into my language, um, and making other choices about how that changes. So that would be a posteriori, coming from an existing language, or if it all just comes out of my brain and I'm making up the words from my own imagination. Um, and I can't answer this half of the question yet because I don't know what approach is going to be best, and I want to get further in the grammar before I make that decision of basically what will be most efficient and what will be most conducive to my goal. Um, so this half of the question isn't answerable yet. I don't know. But it is a personal engineered comment. So that was the first question I had. The second question I had um, was um, 
it was a sub question to the first question. So along with what kind of language this is, one of the questions I had was, is it a personal language? And if so, are other people going to be allowed to or encouraged to use it um, for their themselves if they happen to like it and they want to talk about stuff and feel like they can use it themselves? Maybe they also want to write stuff about humanities and social sciences. Um, then uh, is that is that okay? Like, are they, are am I okay with other people using the language? And I will say, um, I do plan on when this language is more developed or even close to. F finished is a weird word because you can always be adding more words to things and changing things and tweaking things. But when I feel satisfied with the grammar and have a good enough vocabulary to get started with things, I will be putting resources for it up on my website and I will have links to that um, in the appropriate places. So um, I'm fine with other people using it if they like it. Um, just I just want to be clear that um, there is this personal aspect and when I say personal, I just mean to my tastes. But if you share my tastes, and you like it, you are welcome to use it. You're even welcome to maybe um, derive your own language from it. Um, maybe derive or borrow things from it. Um, I would be fine with that so long as I'm, like you say, where it comes from, right? Um, at least give credit to where, where you were inspired from. I'm totally fine with other people. It would actually be really cool if other people wanted to also use this language when it's more at a usable stage. So that's that question. And then my next question, um, actually, let me make sure I'm not skipping a question. I think there's only one more question, right? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, so, um, my last question was, why am I making this language in the order that I am? Um, and I think they referenced someone else. I think they referenced um, Bibliridian, and Bibliridian does conlang showcases and explains their process with making their conlang sometimes. Um, they have like a whole series of, of current conlang that they're working on. Um, and uh, Bill Gradian and, and other people who share their conlangs use a particular, go in a particular order when they're making a conlang that I am not really following. Um, and someone asked why. Why am I doing that? Um, wouldn't it make more sense to go in that order? So I want to talk about what that order tends to be. So I have here categories, and these categories phonology, morphology, syntax, pragmatics, and uh, here I have lexicon, usually semantics would be the other category, but here I'm just putting lexicon because that's going to be the dictionary. Um, like what is in the lexicon. Um, these, this is sort of the order um, that um, a lot of people who make conlangs tend to go in, and even I tend to go in this language, this, this order when I'm making conlangs. Um, and I think part of the reason um, that, that teaching, like people who teach how to make conlangs tend to teach it in this order, um, is partially because this is the order of linguistics core that you tend to learn when you study linguistics. Of course, everyone's linguistics education looks a little bit different, but things tend to go in this order. And part of that, I think, is because you're going from smaller to bigger in terms of units of language. So with phonology, you're talking about the sound of language, so the individual sounds that exist and how they interact with each other. Morphology is about like pieces of meaning, as like pieces of words and affixes and other things that get put together or rearranged in different ways um, and might change um, to put words together. Syntax is about the order of things and the interaction of things, um, how you interpret strings of information together, uh, which can kind of apply to both of these retroactively as well. Um, and then we have pragmatics, which is how language is used in context. So when you have, you know, your sentences and stuff, how, how are things interpreted differently? What kinds of changes can happen? Like deletions, pragmatic deletions, like when you have context involved. Um, and then we have, of course, the lexicon is putting the dictionary together once you figure all that out. And so because that's the, the sort of order a lot of linguistics education tends to go in. That's also the order that a lot of conlangers make their languages in. It kind of feels appropriate to go in that order a lot of the time. And I often also go in this order. Um, the reason I'm not here is really because of what my goals are. So if my goal was a bit different, like instead of having this sort of engineered language kind of goal, if I were thinking more like, I wanna make a naturalistic sounding artistic language, um, so a language that sounds like it could be a real spoken language, 
for my D and D campaign or my fictional universe or something, um, and I wanted it to sound like, you know, a spoken language. I, I do want this language to sound like a spoken language. I talked about that earlier. That's part of my aesthetic is I want it to sound like a spoken language. But um, let's say I wanted to just purely make it artistic and fit in this imaginary world or something. Then I would probably go in this order because I would start with what do I want it to sound like. How do I want things to put, be put together? What order do I want things to go in? What kind of contextual things will matter? And then I'd make my dictionary and then start using the language in whatever context I wanted in for poetry, for, you know, dialogue in um, a book, I'm a fantasy book I'm writing, or in a D&D campaign or something like that. Um, or if I were making an oxlang, I would also want to think about these things. Um, an auxiliary language between speakers of different languages, I would want to start with maybe the sounds that those different speakers could pronounce based on their native language. What kinds of like ways of putting words together would be the most neutral, in quotes, between the speakers of the different languages I'm trying to um, compromise between. Um, same for sort of the order. What order would be like the most logical for that scenario? And, and I'd go from there. So this is a very common order that uh, conlangers will go in. Why am I not going that way for this language? And the, the answer is my goals. I always like my goals to kind of determine how I make a language because then I could stay on goal. <laughs> um, I can make sure I'm keeping to it. And I could have theoretically came up with these goals but then gone straight into the sound system. Um, but I don't think that works particularly well for this goal because um, I want my language to have as much detailed information as is reasonable and not horrendous to memorize <laughs> in a small space um, for this kind of information. And so I would like to know how many distinctions for different things I want, um, how, how distinct I want things to be from each other, how many forms of, say, different noun endings I want. I want to know that first before I think about how many sounds I want, because how many sounds, like distinct sounds from each other I need will be determined by what, what the sort of grammatical form will be. So I'm actually kind of going in a different order here. I've mostly started with morphology, um, I've actually color-coded and also put in parentheses for M for morphology tables um, these different different um, sheets in that category, and I'm going to continue to kind of color-code in this way. Um, most of them will just have this label on it anyway, but for morphology, because there's different ones, I'm also putting M there. Um, so um, I kind of started with that because the first thing I thought about with humanities is I want a lot of different... I want clear ways to know what kind of noun something is so I can easily make agreement and refer back to things and have it clear what I'm referring back to. Um, and so the first thing I thought of was, okay, I'm going to think about what kind of nouns I want. And so that's why I started with nouns. And then I thought, okay, I also want to think about what kind of verb distinctions I want. So I went on to verbs, um, etc. So that is why I went in that order. Um, and then I kind of thought about syntax a bit because I was thinking about verbs. So I went to syntax. Um, and once I figured that out, I went back to my nouns to figure out what cases they'll need based on the syntax. Um, if it will load in just a second, then we'll be good to go with that. Um, so um, that is why I am going in this kind of non-traditional order when it comes to my process of making the language. Um, oh, you, you're just seeing the noun classes here. Um, the cases are the last thing I did last time. Um, so, um, so that that's why I'm going in that order. Um, so I'm just going to keep doing what is what fit is leading into each other. What one thing leads to the next, um, based on how I'm following these goals. I am going to keep track of though how like whether or not I'm covering what I need to cover. I'm not forgetting anything in these different categories. So what I did is I made a more detailed agenda, um, which shows um, what particular thing I'm talking about, what category it's in, based on like the traditional sort of categories that you use with linguistics. Um, and I'm also marking like when it's done and when I've done it. So um, that is why I'm going in that order. And that is questions done. Of course, if there's any other questions people have about my general process or 
about this language in particular or about a specific linguistics thing I bring up or anything like that, I am happy to answer it. So please feel free. Um, oh, we have a question. What is the question? I'm happy to answer. In the meantime, while you're typing that out, I'm going to do a review of what we've done so far. Um, how am I? Oh, I am doing well. It's been a long day, but a good day. Um, I'm just drinking some peppermint tea. Um, so yeah, that's how I am. I'm, do I'm doing it. I'm very excited to be Conley. I think that's this is the thing I've been looking forward to all week. So thank you for that question. Um, all right, so overview of what we've done so far before we continue. So, so far we have our goals. So the goal is to be particularly useful in writing about the humanities and social sciences, just because that's what I end up doing a lot of work with. And I'd like to have personal notes in a conlang that is efficient for these purposes. And I want that detailed information to be compact um, rather than being super drawn out with a lot of, um, a lot of convoluted phrases. I would like things to be sort of like contained and I want it to be aesthetically pleasing to me, more so than maybe a lot of the academic English <laughs> that's used in these um, these fields would be. I want it to just be fun and cool and be extra excited to do the kind of research I end up doing a lot of anyway um, by putting it on conlang. So that's the goal, um, to make it conducive to these kind of fields here. Um, so um, those were the goals. And then I also talked about some features that I knew I would want involved in this uh, language that would probably help with these. So one was easy derivation between um, parts of speech is what that stands for. Um, uh, I want fusional typology, which we are going to talk about typology is the first thing we're going to get to after I do the overview. So you can hold tight on that if that's confusing. Um, noun declensions, I knew I wanted noun declensions. That kind of goes with the fusional typology. Um, and so I'll, I'll re-explain that as well. And I don't want it to be minimalistic. That's kind of kind of opposed to this goal. I want detailed information, not super vague and needing long strings of multiple words to explain a simple thing. So um, those are the features. And then as we've gone, we've had some influences from other languages. Um, Turkic languages in the evidentiality, which I'll talk about. Bantu languages with the noun classes and Germanic languages, older Germanic languages with dative experiencers. So that will all become clear as I go through. So the first thing we did after we came up with features and goals was talking about nouns. And I decided that I wanted a robust system of noun classes. Um, so when I say noun class, this is a category of noun that will actually be important to know when it comes to agreement of things like adjectives or pronouns. So if I, let's say I'm talking about a particular tradition in a particular culture, let's say I'm writing about anthropology, um, and then I continue on writing more sentences, and then I say it in a later sentence, for example, I want the it to actually mark that the it in question is a tradition, because that will help, you know, make it clear that I'm referring to the tradition and not some other it, like if a phenomenon comes up, then that will be a different pronoun or a different form of the same pronoun that we'll refer back. Same goes with adjectives. If I'm describing one of these things, the adjective could agree with the gender here. Um, I might accidentally go back and forth between saying gender and saying noun class. They're kind of synonyms. I prefer the term noun class, but just due to habit, I end up saying gender a lot of the time too. So we could say this language has 10 genders or 10 noun classes. I have some examples here. I went through these last time of like just kind of the range of words that would fall into that category. Since last time, I also added some sort of um, little abbreviations here. Um, this is going to be useful for glossing later. So if I'm sort of describing how a sentence is structured in the language and I'm writing like, oh, and this is the ending for a substance, I'll write M-A-T-R to mark like that this is this is that noun class that it's referring to. I could also use numbers if I wanted to, but numbers are also used for persons when we're talking about pronouns and that could get confusing. So I'm going to stick to these um, abbreviations that I've come up with for the um, the different classes. So like concept, phenomenon, matter, tool, food. Uh, I did geog for like geographic for like locations, uh, flora, fauna, humans, and supernatural entities here. Um, so that's the first thing we did. We talked about different noun classes. And at first I think I had 12 or 13 and then I reduced it down to 10. I might 
go back and reduce this even more if I find that some of these different categories aren't useful. These are just the ones I thought would be useful from an anthropo uh, anthropological perspective because these different things come up in anthropology, tools versus food versus traditions versus places, um, and then like different plants and animals could be salient um, if we get into like other scientific fields. Because I think at first I was talking about other sciences I'm interested in, like biology and stuff. So these could still be useful. And then also with regards to food, you know, there are plant foods and animal foods and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of talked through why I had these different categories the first in the first session that is now lost to time. Um, and then I talked about number and how I wanted number to look. So we talked about singular versus plural, singular dual plural. Um, there are even more things like pockel, like a few, tr uh, trial, three, quadril, four. We could go up and up and up um, different systems. We talked about collective singulative. Um, and then finally, I landed on this kind of thing where I have mass and count, um, which can also be collective and singulative or plurative depending on the noun class that I'm using. So there's just kind of an unmarked one, which is either mass or collective, depending on what makes sense for that class, and then count or singulative plurative. So I'll explain once more what these are. So a mass noun is something like, make sure I'm in the right category, something like, I'll go, I'll go plant, I'll say wheat, well, wheat, or I could say corn, yeah, let's say corn. So corn is kind of a mass noun, it just is corn together, you don't really talk about, it, it's not count in that you don't say you have five corns typically. English is kind of weird because we often allow sort of weird count things to happen to our mass nouns, but Stereotypically, um, we would say that corn is a mass noun. Rice would be another mass noun. Sand, up here, we have sand for a substance, would be a mass noun. And the prevalence of mass nouns in these categories is why I ended up going with a mass count system, just because of how many of these things will prototypically be mass. And then I'd like kind of count thing counting things would be more sort of the deviation there. Um, so corn is mass. And then a singulative, if I were to do a singulative of corn, I would actually not do a singulative. I'll, I'll get to singulative in a bit. Um, uh, if I wanted to count corn, I usually in English, for example, would have to make it count by using a sort of counter word um, that is now my new noun. So like an ear of corn. So corn is still mass here, and I'm just doing an ear of it. So this is kind of like a partitive construction that's like a part of a whole. So if the whole is the mass, kind of concept of corn. An ear of corn is like a count and I can have, now I can count it. It's a count noun now. Ear is a count noun and I could say, you know, seven ears of corn. I could count it. Whereas before I couldn't count seven corns really, um, at least not easily. So um, uh, that is mass versus count. Now collective singulative is a bit different. Um, collective um, versus singulative, mostly is going to come into play maybe with some non-human animals, and then um, uh, humans, and maybe some supernatural entities as well. So, um, sorry, one second, my dog is wanting attention. <laughs> uh, so, um, a collective noun is when you are talking about something as a group. Um, so, um, for example, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, you could have um, you could say, like, lions as a group. Like, a group. Like, so, like, lions. When I say lions in the collective, I mean, like, the species, usually. Like, I could say something like, lions um, tend to live in a savanna-type environment. When I say lions there, lions is collective. I'm talking about, like, all lions in a group. I could also be having a more specific group, but t typically it's like, I'm thinking of lions as a collective group. I'm not thinking of an individual lion or 
counting individual lions. Like, if I had seven lions, um, that would be not collective, but um, what we might call plurative. Um, so both of these, we could call these, in English, these would both be plural, because we have a singular plural number system. But if we're thinking of this from a collective point of view, we have collective and then we have plurative. If we had one lion, that would be sort of singulative. If we're thinking of lions as a group, just like a group of lions or lions as a species, as the default. Um, one, I think an easier way to think about this might be of thinking of some of the terms of venery that you might have heard of, or like nouns of assembly. These are like the fun, kooky terms that you might have heard of when people are talking about like a murder of crows. Um, we have the word pride. So pride would be, like when we're talking about a pride of lions. Um, so pride is singular in English. We could have multiple prides, now it's count. Um, pride is a count noun just in general. We could have one pride, we could have many prides. But pride is a collective, it's talking about a group of lions. So when I say lions, I could be referring to a pride in this number system. So um, what I decided was I wanted mass and collective to be the default, and then if it's singular or plurative, if it's count, um, if we're in more of these like animal human area, but most of the other ones it'll just be count versions of the mass nouns, um, then it's going to be marked in some way for um, its number, which is the opposite of how it tends to go in English. In English we tend to have singular things be, you know, the normal um, noun, and then we add, you know, usually an S for plural. And that's how many languages, most languages, um, some languages have a collective singulative and others have like inverse number where some noun classes are by default collective and others are by default singular. Um, so this is kind of inverse in that what the default is and what the non-default changes depending on the um, uh, the class. But in general the idea is still the same, mass versus count and sing uh, collective versus singulative or plurative. So how would I differentiate between singulative and plurative? Um, well, it's not really marked, so there isn't going to be a difference between saying one countable lion, one singulative lion, and seven lions. The ending on lion is going to be the same. It's just going to be different than whatever lions as a group or a pride would be. Um, so these would probably be the same word in this language. A pride of lions and then lions taken as a group would probably be the same word. Um, because I don't foresee myself needing to distinguish that kind of thing. I don't really feel the need to have specific terms of venery for different animals, um, I could just use the collective for them. Um, but how do I tell if it's like one countable line versus many? Um, I think what I'm going to want to do is have numbers be relatively easy to use and have some easy ways to say just multiple versus a few versus one. Um, so I want I, when I get to my number system, I want it to be relatively compact because that's one of my goals. I want an easy way to differentiate one individual versus many individuals um, that are counted as opposed to the group as whole. So we can kind of see how this ref to, relates to humans thinking about lions. And because I'm coming at a lot of things from like an anthropology and history point of view, um, um, I still think the map, like the sort of collective singulative makes a lot of sense for my goals because I'm often talking about cultures as a whole. So if I say, I think the example I've been giving a lot of the time was like the word Italian. <laughs> if I say Italian, the default is going to be collective. So if I say Italian and don't mark it for anything, it's going to mean Italians like in general. Italians or Italian culture or cultures, plural to be more accurate, but um, Italians as a whole, you know, culturally, or I might be talking about the Italian language. And so that might be more of an abstract now, but um, if I'm talking about the humans or it might be actually, it would be a tool if it were a language, actually. But um, if I'm talking about Italians as a whole, the culture, I would use like a human, unmarked, for whatever the word for Italian is. And if there are, if there is an individual Italian I'm talking about, I would have it be marked for count. Um, it wouldn't be called count for human, it would be called singulative, but the ending would be the same as it is for count for other nouns. So it would be some kind of marking on Italian to show that it's, I'm not taking them as a whole, but I'm talking about individuals. So, Italians, so there could be like, you know, 50 Italians in an army or something. 
uh, like a, not an army, but like a, a regiment of an army or something like that. Um, I don't do a lot of work with military history, so <laughs> pardon me if I'm using the wrong terminology there. Um, but yeah, so individual Italian or Italians um, would be count, and in that case, sort of maybe the default reading would be an Italian as opposed to Italians as a whole, and then I could add numbers to make that multiple, um, or just have a word for multiple that kind of tacks on, or like an ending that kind of tacks on extra, if that's unclear. But where, with people, a lot of the time I'm going to be talking about a particular individual, like, um, for example, if I have a word for brother, brother by default will be collected, so it's like all brothers in the scenario, so all of my brothers, if you have multiple. So brother by default will mean brothers, um, and then if I have brother marked for something, um, for count, then that would mean like a brother or some of the brothers. <laughs> and um, in order for that to be an interpretation, I'd probably want a number there. So three of the brothers, three brothers, or seven brothers, but not all of them. Because if it's all, that's going to be collective, in which case I'd just not mark it. Um, so it could still be useful even with humans when I'm talking about cultures. And with individuals, it's usually going to be clear. So if I have someone's name, like the example here, Harold Godwinson, um, Anglo-Saxon Anglo king. Uh, he's probably going to be one. I probably don't even need to mark that he's one in any way, shape, or form. But I would use the sing the count because technically the um, the mass of that, <laughs> the collective of that, would just be all Harold Godwinsons that have ever existed, which it's not too uncommon of a name. So it would refer to like a collection of Harold Godwinsons, which um, probably won't come up very much. And I'm thinking... Um, I've, I've reflected on this a little bit. I think I might do something tricky, actually, with the um, collective of names. Because names, by default, of individuals are going to tend to be count, so they'll need that count ending on them. Um, so I might do something sort of sneaky or clever with the collective. Like, maybe something like things associated with... All things associated with that person or something. I'll come back to this later. Um, so that, th those were the first things I did in my first session. I did the goals, I talked about noun classes, and noun number. Um, the second session, I talked about verbs. Um, so I talked about, like, tense, aspect, mood, evidentiality, voice, etc. Um, and I came to this kind of a system. Um, so I'll just explain the system I have because I can't re retread all of that, all of that information right now. Um, but... Um, what um, I came to was that I'm going to have two tenses, past and non-past. So what that means is um, there's past tense, things that happened in the past, and then non-past could be present or future. Um, so if I wanted to specify a future, I could. I could have some strategy for doing that. But because I'm mostly talking about, you know, history, anthropology, and linguistics. I'm mostly talking about things that are currently the case with linguistics and anthropology, or things that happened in the past. So I'm not really going to be talking about the future very much with this language. Um, so if I ever need to make some kind of prediction or something, either I'm going to use the Arialis, or I'm going to have some kind of marking for the future. Um, so that's the tenses. Then I have, in the past tense, I actually have a distinction here, two aspects. Um, and I just went with a simple perfective imperfective. And what that means is perfective, something happened sort of at one point in time um, or a particular point in time and then was completed. And then imperfective is something was ongoing. It happened repeatedly or over a period of time that is not specified or as other specific events were happening um, is what imperfective is. Um, maybe it was habitually or in progress or something like that. That's per imperfective. And because I'm going to be talking about the past a lot, I think it makes sense to have a distinction between those two things. Things that were ongoing, maybe things that were generally the case in a particular time period, versus specific events that occurred. That would be more perfective. Um, and I also decided that I would want the perfective past to be the unmarked one, the mo most default one. Because I figured with how much I'm writing about history and historical events, that I would you know, have that be the most frequent thing that comes up potentially. And I could change that if I find that imperfective is more common. But um, just going on what I assumed, I decided that that would be the unmarked one. That's what these slash, these like slashed O's here mean. That's what this is doing. Um, 
it just means that it's null. So there's not going to be a special ending for perfected pass. And all the other ones are going to be special endings added onto it. So that is tense and aspect. Um, then I have mood, and I have two moods, realis and irrealis. So the simple way to explain that is realis is things that are real, <laughs> um, things that happened for sure or are happening for sure. Um, and, and when I say for sure, I just mean like we're pretty confident that they happened. Um, so um, things that are within reality. Um, mostly this would be things that we'd call like indicative in a lot of European languages. Um, they're just true. It happened or it's happening. Um, and then irrealis is just anything else. So hypotheticals, you know, this could happen, this would happen, this might happen. Um, I want it to happen, like wishes, hopes, dreams, <laughs> not actual dreams that happen, but like hopes, um, aspirations, and potentially commands. I doubt I'll use commands much in this language because I'm not going to be telling people what to do <laughs> when I'm describing history or anthropology or anything like that. Um, but if I were to do that in this language, I would use the irrealis because that's what that would be. Um, and then finally, this primary secondary thing. Now this is evidentiality, and this is where like the influence from Turkic languages comes in. So, um, um, basically, <laughs> um, Turkic languages tend to have something called indirectivity with evidentiality, which is like either the source of your information is yourself, it's direct, or it's not. Um, you, you don't, you know, you aren't the source of how you know it was true. It, it just, you know, either someone told you or, um, you, um, are inferring it or, um, you know, you're, um, in some other way receiving it secondhand or something like that. Um, a lot of other languages will actually have specific evidentialities for how you get the information. So, whether someone's like you weren't a particular witness to it but someone else was um or you know it's hearsay it's been spread to you someone told you um and um uh there, there are other ones too in whether it's an inference versus hypothetical lots of different evidential systems but what i'm doing is i'm kind of taking indirectivity in a very like literal scholarly direction which is not how it works in Turkic languages because they're not designed for <laughs> um, social sciences. Um, what I'm doing is whether my source is primary or secondary, my source of information. So if I'm talking about something that happened in history or some ling doing some linguistic description of how a language works, um, do I have a primary source for that? Or do I have a secondary source? Thank you for being in the stream. Um, all right, um, someone's just signing off. Um, so... If it's primary, that means either I have documentation directly in that language, I have a source for that language, like I know someone who's speaking it and that's where I'm getting my information from, or I have a text in that language that I'm working with, or I am personally just, you know, doing field work, I'm listening to the language and describing it. Same thing if it's history. So either I have, you know, let's say I'm writing about um, uh, the history of pottery in Etruscan culture. I would use primary evidentiality if um, my source is an Etruscan text, of which there are not many actually, or I'm specifically looking at an Etruscan piece of pottery and making deductions directly from that. That would be primary, like I'm the one who's coming up with the knowledge, or I have direct access to the knowledge from the time period or the language. And then secondary would be just if it's not. So um, I put these in quotes because, you know, my source is another scholar who maybe they looked at it. I don't have access to it. They looked at it and they were making sort of assertions. So if I trust the source, this is where we get into like sort of evidentiality and it's kind of overlap with mood here. Um, like how real is it? If I trust my source and I think it is real, then I would use secondary. Like my, I'm looking in a textbook and the textbook says that in this culture, they, you know, make baskets in this particular way. If I trust that, um, I'll say it's secondary. Like, I'll use that marking on the verb. Like, um, let's say, um, in medieval Ireland, they made 
baskets with this type of material. And I don't know that personally. I haven't read any medieval Irish documents that say so, but I trust that this author has, you know, done their thing. Maybe they cite their sources or they, you know, they just are an expert in that field and I trust them. Then I would say, when I say the word weave, when I have my verb, whenever it comes up, it will be marked for secondary evidentiality to show that the weaving, I believe it, it's just I'm not the one who is the source of this information, or I don't have a direct source of the information. If I don't trust my source, then we get into irreality. If I'm doubting it, if I'm like, this could have happened, but I'm not sure, and my source isn't one that I'm like confident enough in to say that it was real, then I just go into irreality. So it's a, it's a hypothesis that I am not sure about, versus I trust this hypothesis, I think it's likely, then I put it here. So that's the difference there. Um, so the reason I have these two tables here is this one is just giving an example of sort of an English thing. This was me explaining the system. And then um, this is where I'm actually probably going to end up putting what the sort of markings for the word are. How I'm marking the verb to indicate these different things. And I put, again, I put this here to show that there's not going to be a particular marking for this. It'll just be whatever, whatever shows that this is a verb will go there. Um, okay, and then the other thing I talked about on my second session was syntax. I talked about what um, what sort of structure. I talked about alignment first, the morphosyntactic alignment. How am I relating um, actors in a particular verb, um, a particular sentence to each other, and how am I determining who does what? So I went into a very long explanation of all the different, like the main different morphosyntactic alignments. Um, and I landed on what's called active stative alignment with a fluid S system. And I've said, this is a system I tend to use in a lot of artistic conlangs um, because I like it, I like how it works, it's very flexible. But I also do think it would be very useful for this language because of how elegant it is. Because I do want, one of my goals is compact, um, and I want to be able to express relationships between words in as few places as possible. And I could have particular endings for all these different um, ways that like doers and doies of verbs could have with each other. Um, whether verbs are intransitive, they, they don't have like an object, or they do have an object and they're transitive. Um, but instead, I would like to just have um, that be demonstrated um, with uh, an active stative system. So what that means, and it's fluid S means fluid of what the intransitive subject could be whether it's agentive or patientive. Agentive means that um, you're marking that the, the um, well, not necessarily marking, but agentive just means that you're talking about the doer of a transitive action. So if I kicked the ball, I is the agent and ball is the patient. Um, patientive would be, you know, talking about the patient. And in English, when we have nominative accusative, meaning that agent and intransitive uh, subject are the same, what that means is that I kicked the ball and I slept, the I is the same, because um, I is the subject in both. So you're treating the doer of, um, or just the one who's going through an intransitive verb, like sleep, the same as the doer of a transitive verb. And I talked about languages where it does the opposite, and you have the patient, um, you have the, sorry, you have the one undergoing the intransitive verb being the same as the patient. So instead of like, I slept, it would be like, me slept. Um, I kicked the ball, the ball's the patient, me slept, me is the patient of sleep. So you're kind of making it less, um, it's just how the language works. It uses patientive for intransitives. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm probably not explaining it very thoroughly now because I've explained it twice now. Um, but I, I went over this again last time, so if you want to see that, you can. If someone in the chat really does feel like they need an explanation for this, do not hesitate. I do not mind going this, over this again. I just, right now, I'm going through the overview of what we've done so far, so we can get to the new stuff. So, um, what fluid as active stative means is that you can do either, and it's a choice. That's what the fluid means. I can choose depending on how I want, what I want my verb to mean, how I want to treat intransitive. So for example, a transitive sentence like I, or let's say like Joe, uh, let's say Joe kicked the ball. Joe, ki Joe kicked the ball. Um, 
Um, and then I could have Joe slept and slept in and like just have Joe be the same as the Joe here. Um, or I could say um, Joe slept, but have Joe be the same as the ball. So in one, Joe is agentive. Joe is the agent of sleep. Um, and in the other, Joe is patientive. So they look the same because this is English and English doesn't work this way. Um, but um, the difference between these two would be, so in some languages where it's not fluid, sleep just might determine that you have to use it one way or the other and like a different verb will use something different. That would be a split S active stated language. But in fluid S, I can choose, no matter what the verb is, I can choose how I want to mark Joe. And that would imply different things. So if I said Joe patientive slept, that probably just means that Joe is asleep or fell asleep or something like that. Um, Joe is sort of the the one who had sleep happen to them. Um, it was like they were the undergoer rather than the doer. And if I have Joe agentive slept, that would be more something like Joe went to sleep. Joe actively chose to sleep, got in bed and, you know, tried to fall asleep, counted sheep or something. Um, so with the same words, but different marking, I'm getting across two very different ideas. So what this does is it allows me to not have to have a separate word for like go to sleep versus fall asleep. Um, and I just talk about the different relationships to sleep that the doer of this intransitive has. Um, so that's what I talked about on the second during the second session. And I think that's about as far as I went the second session. Um, and then the third session, um, we talked about ditransitives. And so ditransitives is when we add another required element. Usually these are verbs of giving. So like, I lent Joe five dollars. Um, in that sentence, I is the donor. Um, it tends to be the same as the agent, and I decided that's how I want to do that, too. I want the agent to be the same as the donor. Um, I is the donor. I'm the giver. Um, lend is the verb. So I lent Joe $5. So Joe is the recipient of the money, and then the money, the $5, is the patient. That's It's really the theme. It's the thing that's being given, um, but I've chosen to make it the same as the patient, which is the most common thing to do. Um, so... What I've decided to do is the thing, um, I'm just having what's called um, uh, indirective alignment for the ditransitives, uh, which means it's kind of what most European languages do, and it's what is most natural to me, I think. Um, but a lot of languages do this. Um, it's not just European languages. Um, where the donor is the agent, so it's just agentive. The, the theme is marked patientive, um, or is treated as a patientive, and then the recipient is in the Dative. So that's a special case for recipients, um, and I'm also using dative for some other things as well. Now, patientive is what I've decided is going to be unmarked. Um, there's not going to be a marking for uh, patientive, because I suspect with the topics that I'm talking about that patientive is going to come up a lot with intransitives. I'm going to have a lot of like sort of passive type constructions. Like, um, that just is the nature of a lot of academic writing, is that there's a lot of passive stuff when you don't have a particular explicit agent of what do does something, but something just happens. So I decided to make patientive unmarked and have a special marking for agentive. And then I have this asterisk here, and this is where the Germanic, old Germanic influence comes in. Um, if I have a transitive verb, or what would be a transitive verb, but it has to do with um, cognition or perception, um, I tend to like that languages don't mark those the same, because if I have a word um, and this is another way to like have compact information efficiently. Um, if I have a way to say like I see the tree versus I look or I look at the tree, there's a difference between these two verbs. Um, in English, we mark this with one is a transitive verb with a direct object. Uh, so I is like the we'd say like the actor or the doer, and then tree is the um, the thing that you see. So we would call that the object. Uh, whereas I look at the tree, I, you know, is very clearly an agent. You're actively doing something, you're choosing to do it. And then the tree in English is the object of a preposition at. Um, 
but um, that's kind of clunky and it requires extra words. Um, I'd need a separate word for look and I, you know, would be like using this extra preposition, which I wouldn't necessarily need to do. Um, a lot of languages just have a special word that means to look at um, or to like to watch. I could say I watch the tree and have it mean like a very similar thing. Um, so some languages don't even distinguish between these two things also. Like they might just not care. Um, but the roles that these have are different. The I in these sentences and the tree a little bit too, but mostly the I is different. The tree could be seen as the same thing in most languages. Um, the tree is just kind of there <laughs> doing its thing. It's just chilling. So that would be patient if I think in either case. In, th in this language for sure it would be patient if. But there's a difference between the I in watch or look at and the I in see. With see, you're just commenting that you have the ability to see it. It is in your view. Um, you are there. The tree is there. And the like light bouncing off the tree is going into your eyes. Your eyes are receiving it, and your brain is parsing it. And you that is what we call seeing. Um, whereas with watch the tree, you're doing something very deliberately. You are putting your attention actively on the tree. So we would call this eye here in this sentence with I see the tree as we would call that an experiencer semantically. Um, the role of I is experiencer, whereas the role here is a more stereotypical agent, a, like an active doer choosing deliberately to watch the tree, like putting their attention on it, as opposed to sort of not necessarily passively, but just sort of like receptively understand that the tree is present by way of their eyes. So uh, what old Germanic languages do, not necessarily for C, but more with things like emotions, like um, to, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, to feel ill, or um, to, I'm trying to think of more good examples, um, maybe to dislike or be saddened by something, or something like that, to dislike um, or to like, or to seem, or anything like that, um, what they'll do is they'll actually put the experiencer in the dative. So they'll say something more like, the tree is visible to me. And the um, the Germanic languages don't specifically do this with C, they might use a different verb, but the idea would be the same where the tree is actually kind of like a patientive, intransitive subject. And then the, um, the, um, Seer is more like an indirect object. However, what makes this still sort of like syntactically an agent is I could still have the person who's in the dative be the subject. Um, so if I continue on with other things, um, they would still be referred to as if they were the subject. So it's like, to me, the tree is seen or something along those lines. Um, as opposed to I, agentive, watch the tree. So I would also, the other benefit of this, like with the sort of fluid S thing, um, I would have the benefit of not needing two different words. See and watch could be the same word, but still make that distinction by marking the um, the one who sees or watches differently. So that's what that dative experiencer means. The experiencer, someone who's just passively taking in cognitive information, is dative, whereas someone who's actively doing something with their perception, like paying attention, listening as opposed to hearing, um, you know, reading and studying as opposed to looking at the page and not really taking it in, those would be marked differently rather than expressed with different verbs. And so that keeps it compact and keeps my like general word count down. So it makes it a little bit easier to potentially learn as well. The only learning curve would then be remembering to use it this way, which again, personal aspect, I don't really struggle with because I'm used to it with other languages like ancient Germanic languages that do that. Um, so then after we talked about ditransitives, oh, I do want to talk about topic prominent. And that was just in terms of the order. I haven't decided many things about the word order yet, like whether or not I want, you know, heads to come after their modifiers or come before them or anything like that. But what I do know is I want the language to be topic prominent because I, I want generally things to be marked with case. Like I'm going to have noun declensions, like I said. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more. But, um, so, nouns on themselves will be marking what their function is. Um, it's just, if it doesn't have a marking, then it's the patient. Um, any other marking will, you know, tell you what the role is of that word in the sentence. So, 
technically that leaves a lot of things open in terms of word order, like things can come before the verb, things can come after the verb. I like having the verb close to the beginning of the sentence. However, I did decide that I want the topic to come before the verb, and that allows me to highlight certain important things by making them the topic simply by moving them to the beginning of the sentence before the verb, and have everything else come after the verb. Um, so if the patient of a transitive verb is the topic, it would come first. Um, whereas if the agent was the topic, it would come first. Um, or I could just not have the topic marked at all and have them all come after. Um, but the reason I like that is because I can kind of do what passive constructions do when we make something passive to make the object into the subject. Um, I'm already kind of doing that in terms of the relationship between the object and the subject with my way that I do intransitives, but it would still be nice to be able to highlight important things with the topic being first. So I say topic prominent because the topic is going to come first regardless of what role it has. So it's not that the subject of the verb comes first. It's not that like the doer of an intransitive or the agent of a transitive or the patient of a transitive even necessarily comes first. It's that whatever is important to the conversation or the it's mostly going to be writing. So whatever is important to what I'm writing is going to come first. So it is a signal to future me this is what the sentence is about. Um, okay, and then once I decided on that, I went back to nouns and talked about uh, what cases I wanted since I went down to clenching. And I went through a bunch of different semantic roles. Um, semantic roles being roles that nouns can have in a sentence, um, like sort of jobs they can do. Um, and there were a plethora. I didn't talk about all of them theoretically, but I talked about a lot of them, <laughs> even ones I knew I wasn't going to distinguish, just to like do an overview of that. And if you want to see that, you can look at the past stream. Um, but I sort of combined different roles into cases, meaning they're going to be marked for sort of a host of potential roles, and I'm just fine having those roles be marked the same way. So for example, if something is a patient of a verb, or if it's a theme, um, theme is just kind of something that's just chilling. Often that is the same as a patient. But we could also have intransitive verbs like the sky is blue. In the sky is blue, the sky is just a theme. It's just kind of chilling. Nothing's happening to the sky. It's not a patient, um, but it's just there. Uh, it's going to be unmarked because uh, that we would mark it patientive anyway. Um, oh, yeah, I will explain the alienability in just a second. Um, I just got a comment about that. I'll go through that. Um, thank you. Um, and if it's a stimulus, that will be patient. So um, last time, I went kind of through all the different roles that I wanted to think about and kind of grouped them into cases. And I ended up with um, six marked cases and one unmarked case. So patientive, unmarked, everything else marked. Um, and some particularly strange things that I did, or not strange, but of note, are I have a dative and an ablative. And the dative, we just talked about why it marks the experiencer, but I also am marking, you know, beneficiary of an action that you do for someone or recipient, like we talked about with the ditransitives, um, the goal of an action, like or motion, the purpose of an action. Um, we talked a lot about purpose constructions and using the irrealis as well with that if you have a clause. We can go back over that again at some point. Um, and then I did something with possession here. Um, so ablative marks kind of the inverse of that, the source um, of motion, the cause of an action, something you're comparing to, um, the concern, a topic that you're bringing up. And then with possession, I was going to have a genitive case. Um, and I talked a lot about like the pros and cons of having that in this language. But I decided that I do want to make an alienability distinction. Um, and how I'm doing that is something that um, I actually did in a collaborative project before um, with some other people, where we had a dative and an ablative. And the dative that's sort of towards the, um, the possessor um, means that you possess, they possess something, but it's not intrinsic to them. Like, it could be taken away from them. So this would be something like, her pen would be alienable. She could give her pen away. It could, you know, kind of, she could lose it, something like that. Whereas her arm, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> is inalienable, meaning it's kind of, like, inherent to her. She could lose her arm, but it's, like, theoretically a part of her body. Um, so it would probably be inalienable. Or something else like her hometown. Like, she may move, but it's still her hometown, so it's inalienable. Or like her heritage or something. That would be inalienable. And I'm marking that with source versus goal, um, 
markings here with the date of an ablative. Then we have a locative uh, location time, um, and then a commutative for, you know, associates, ones you're doing an action with. And we talked about, like, the different sort of interpretations of that as opposed to having multiple agents doing something separately versus having an agent doing something with another agent. So we could say, um, I think the example was, like, I and Sarah solved puzzles. If I just have two separate agents, I, myself and Sarah, um, that could mean that, like, I solve puzzles and also Sarah independently solved puzzles. Whereas if I say, no. I, with Sarah, <laughs> solve, solve puzzles, that would mean we solve them together. And that's that distinction. And then, um, finally, we talked about the, this is like the Vialis case. Um, I'm, I'm still on the fence of whether or not I want to call it um, instrumental or Vialis. I'm just sticking with Vialis for now because I'm talking about manner and measure as well, which are largely adverbial categories um, and function as well. Um, but it's mostly going to mark my paths, instruments, uh, ways I do things, or tools used for things. And then substitute, and there was a sort of asterisk here. Uh, when you're talking about substitute, this is like when you're doing something on someone else's behalf. And the way that this works, um, and I think I got a little confused at first with it, is... Um, uh, sorry for the noise, the dog is just kind of making noise right now. Um, when you are using a Vialis, I'm going to give an example. Um, like, I spoke, um, in English we would usually use, like, a for, or an on x's behalf. Like, for x or on x's behalf. I spoke for Sarah. Like, maybe Sarah was going to give a speech, but could not be present, and so I spoke for Sarah. So there, I is the substitute for Sarah. So Sarah here, so I would be marked Vialis, because I am, like, the instrument of the speaking through which... So I'm kind of like the mouthpiece for Sarah. <laughs> so then we'd have spoke. Um, and then Sarah would actually be the agent. Even though in the English sentence, she's not. <laughs> I am I am the sort of doer of the verb. And she is who I'm substituting. But with the vialis, I'm actually, I am the substitute for her. So she is speaking through me or by way of me. So I am really kind of like the instrument through which she is speaking. in Like she's speaking in spirit through me. <laughs> um, so that is how I'm marking substitute, which is um, an idea I've been thinking about with conlangs, and I'm glad to be able to want to do that, because I think that's going to make a lot of sense in a lot of the historical context I'm going to use this language in, and maybe even the anthropological ones. Um, and I can also imagine, like, certain, if I'm writing about linguistics, I could, like, talk about a specific grammatical category and have it be the Alice for what it expresses, and what it's expressing, that sort of thing, will be in, you know, the source case of whatever it is that it's substituting for. Um, so that is, those are the case, that's the case system that I talked about um, during the third session. And I think that was the last thing I did, which I believe brings us up to date. So it is now um, 637 um 637 Pacific, which gives me a little under an hour to get into the next topic. So we spend a lot of time on questions and review, but I think these were important things to cover, because especially because the first two sessions are lost. Um, I, th I thought it was important to make sure that was all clear and do a thorough review. So now we're going to move on to typology. And so I'm going to talk about what typology is. Um, this kind of brings us back to the question of what kind of conlang this is. So, um, Thinking about my goals one more time, I want to take a look at them. I know I keep going back to this page, but um, being useful, um, particularly um, designed to talk about humanities and social sciences, um, efficient in that regard, um, detailed information is compact, and aesthetically pleasing to me. This is kind of subjective. Um, not even kind of, it's inherently subjective, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, I talked about how why I want fusional typology, but I'm going to talk about what that means. So I'm going to explain typology in two ways, um, both of which can be useful, um, but there's sort of two ways of looking at typology. Um, and knowing this is going to help making decisions for how we're going to move forward with the other sort of categories. Um, let me just check the agenda one more time to make sure I remember what comes after typology that I kind of chose to do. Uh, yeah, pronouns is what's going to come after. Okay.
that's good. That, that works fine. Okay. So, um, the general way that typology is talked about um, is based on Edward Sapir, um, his work in like the late teens, early 1920s, um, on classifying languages based on sort of a combination of how words work in the language and how formatives work. And what all formative is, is it's a part, like a morpheme, a piece of meaning in a word that denotes derivation or inflection. Derivation being sort of ways to mark a word to change its like inherent meaning or maybe part of speech um, or, you know, um, intensify it or make it smaller or bigger or, you know, turn an adjective into a verb or a verb into a noun or anything like that would be derivation. And then inflection would be the other kind of formative, which is changing the grammatical function of a word. You're not changing what the word is, you're changing sort of how it's being used in the sentence. Um, so things like the case of a noun or the tense or aspect or evidentiality of a verb, those could be inflectional. Um, whereas things like changing a verb into a noun or vice versa would be derivational. Anything that does either of those things is called a formative. And those usually modify words or are governed by words. Um, but sometimes they can be independent words phonologically um, in terms of like their sound um, and how they're broken up. But it, that depends highly on the language. And so what Edward Sapir did was he divided languages by category. And um, these categories are the ones that most introductory sort of grammars of languages will use. Or, um, you know, and for that reason that a lot of people in sort of conlanging spaces will use this terminology, and it's, it's serviceable, it works. Um, I tend to use these words just because they're familiar um, to most people in the conlanging sphere, but I'll explain these. So we've got analytic and we've got synthetic. Those are sort of the two, that's like one axis <laughs> of this sort of way of categorizing words and formatives and how they go together. So analytic means you have a low sort of morpheme to word ratio. So words tend to be sort of it has a meaning, and that's it. And then if you want to add more meaning, you tend to like have extra words instead of, you know, add extra prefixes, suffixes, infixes, all that kind of stuff to it. So that's what analytic means. It's sort of a low morpheme to word ratio. Synthetic would be the opposite end of the spectrum, like super far end would be like super synthetic languages would have lots of prefixes, suffixes, infixes, circumfixes, all that kind of stuff added to them. So um, this isn't about necessary length of the words, but how much is on their words. Oh, goodbye. Thank you. Someone else signing off. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, so that's one axis um, of like low morpheme to word ratio, like lot, very few extra formatives on words. Formatives will kind of be on their own. And then synthetic, lots of formatives on words. Um, isolating is sort of a sub a way to describe super analytic languages is like kind of the most analytic you could possibly be is isolating where there's no combinations of morphemes at all. So uh, there's not any kind of compounds or prefixes or suffixes anywhere in the language. You're just purely like word, you know, maybe a particle or a tiny mini word that means past tense and it's its own word, not attached. You know, if you have a compound like mm, pickup truck, you'd have like truck, which, you know, picks up or something like that. You know, you'd have them all separated out, isolated. So it's an isolated language. Um, when we go into the more synthetic area of things, we kind of have two subcategories in Sapir's like sort of typology here, um, way of talking about type of language. Um, we have agglutinative and fusional. And I think I talked about this a little bit in all of the past sessions, but I want a fusional language as opposed to an agglutinative language, so I'll explain what these mean. So agglutinative means you are stacking formatives, usually, onto each other. Um, so let's say you have a past tense marker and like a primary evidentiality marker, if I have that, or a, or I mean secondary probably, because primary will be unmarked, or, um, you know, the realis marker. In an agglutinative language, those will all be stacked. Maybe there will be a particular order I put them in. Maybe like uh, it goes like whether or not it's realis or irrealis goes first. Then I have, you know, non-past. Then I have evidentiality, maybe uh, secondary. 
those would be sort of my that so they would stack so you'd have one ending that means what you know what mood it's in one that means the tense one that means the challenge and then i could do the same thing with noun so let's say i so i have mass count right i could have my count ending and then my case ending and they'd just kind of be two separate endings that stack onto each other um so that would be agglutinative i don't want that because of my goal of compactness fusional is basically not doing that <laughs> and instead having you end up typically with more unique endings this way so that is the like sort of flip side or like opposite end of the curve um but you have maybe like there's a count dative versus count um ablative as opposed to having a count ending and then the dative ending come after it there would be separate ones for each case and each number same with um verbs so I could go, if I go back into my verbs, I could say something like, if it's agglutinative, I could say imperfective is li and non-past is lo, or something like that. I would not want that. <laughs> but, and let's say my secondary ending is like uh, ga. <laughs> then let's say it goes tense, then evidentiality. I could have like liga and loga that would be agglutinative so i'm like kind of just stacking these um and then if i add let's say i add um for irrealis maybe my ending is like nu i could have like linu and lonu again this would be agglutinative so if i wanted it to be fusional these would be unique from each other they, they might have like some similar like aspects to them maybe they come from an agglutinating thing but maybe something more like this where i could have like la um and then i could have like maybe loi or maybe like have this one be completely unrelated like me or um i don't know own or something you know it's just like they're unique from each other. It can be, there can be sort of like little, I would prefer to have like little bits of them that are similar to each other as if they come from agglutinated endings just to help me remember them. Like, oh, that's the imperfective secondary. It kind of comes from a combination of the imperfective and the secondary in some ancient language, ancient form of the language. But in the current one, they're not, you know, stacking separate endings, but instead having like one long one. So that's fusional versus agglutinative and that hopefully explains why i would prefer a fusional language um because it would you know be more compact than having uh, agglutinative so that goes with that now that's one way to look at typology um but it's often seen as pretty incomplete because a lot of it is a spectrum it's all a spectrum and um it's really hard to classify some languages in certain ways like english is both called an analytic language and a synthetic language a lot of the time uh, it's usually considered fusional but highly analytic um because they're not mutually exclusive categories it is generally it generally has a maybe low at least formative per word count there's usually you know we usually have like maybe a plural ending maybe a third person singular verb ending or a past tense ending um but we don't have like multiple different inflectional categories for a lot of things um but at the same time we can have really long compounds um especially with greek and latin roots but even with english roots we can kind of compound things to say like um i don't know mason jar um we can have pretty long compounds not as long as german but we can have some pretty long compounds um and so a lot of linguists have found this superior um edward sapir system to be not the most adequate in terms of describing whoa that's what happens when i lag is that it goes past where i want um to describe most languages so there is a sort of more detailed categorization of typology that um linguists nowadays tend to use um for at least ex describing natural languages um most conlingers still use the older system most linguists even in like their everyday conversations will use everyday linguistics conversations at least will use those um categorizations and they're still like useful um but um 
this more updated system, I think, was like mostly first pioneered in the 80s, 90s without this exact terminology. This exact terminology, I think, comes from, I think I'm accurate in saying, it comes from Bickle and Nichols in the mid 2000s, I think, um, is separately thinking about formatives and ha like how they are behaving in the language and then going to the word category. So this was like that first axis um, that was like the vertical axis was analytic low morpheme to word ratio and then synthetic high morpheme to word ratio. Um, that's sort of just a, a general overall word thing is the level of synthesis. Is it a lot of words being, a lot of morphemes being smashed together into one word or words are kind of in their own little bubbles? So that is that category. Um, and that's sort of the last one you think of when you're considering um, what the language is. Now, I need to actually take a break real quick. Um, I have to attend to something with my dog, so I will be right back. It'll just be about, mm, uh, I think, max of like three minutes. Um, I'll just write that. <laughs> okay, I'll be right back. Thank you. All right, I return. So, sorry about that. So back to typology. Um, so we were talking about a different um, scheme for talking about typology. Um, so this one uh, breaks it down between words and formative. So instead of the sort of combined, often leaving you kind of vague overlap, um, this system is a lot more sort of um, allows you to be a little bit more specific about what you mean when you say things like fusional and stuff. 
So it separates words and formative. So there's the word level of overall, what's the word to morpheme ratio? Is it high or is it low? And of course there's a scale. But I know that I want um, a language where it's compact. And technically, having a bunch of affixes or having words with few affixes could equally be compact depending on how I use like word order and syntax to get things across instead. Um, so either could be potentially viable. So I'm not even sure what I want to do in this regard yet. I'm actually going to add another sort of column here. Um, just to put like my thoughts on what it is. Actually, I shouldn't have added this one. I should have instead. <laughs> I should do this one so it's wider, huh? Okay. Yeah, I think I just wanted this one for space, but that's fine. Um, I'll just put my answer. I'll just italicize it. I think. So, in terms of synthesis, I don't know yet. I will make that decision later on. Um, or it'll just kind of come about, I think. I, I'm fine letting this come about, just however I think is most... Um, most... Not logical, maybe expedient, or... Um, I, guess, I guess logical to me, because it's personal. So yeah, I would say, like, I'll just kind of let this happen in the future. Um... So I'll, I'll, I'll describe what these different categories mean then. <laughs> okay, so fusion is the first sort of way to categorize the formatives. Um, and of course, because I want this language to be fusional, it would be worth it to think more deeply about what kind of fusion I want. So um, this is the level of fusion you have. Um, and it's kind of a spectrum of isolating to nonlinear, but mm, it's not exactly a straight line. So with isolating, what you're doing is you are, um, with isolating, sorry, dog is asking for stuff again. Um, with isolating, it's what we said before, it's kind of like the far end of as analytical as you can get, uh, where everything is in its own sort of unique little box, um, you're not sort of stringing things, you're not stringing affixes to words, you're having everything be its own separate little, probably grammatical particle or something. So, um, that is isolating. Sorry, the dog is very much being <laughs> misbehaving right now. Um, I'm gonna need another second, sorry. <laughs> I will be right back. <laughs> I'm back. Apologies. So, that's isolating. Isolating is everything in its own unique box. Um, separate words for everything. Um, the next um, subcategory is concatenative. And what this means is they are bound to the word. Um, 
but they um, are kind of coming in a row. So this would be kind of like in an agglutinative language. Where you have sort of stacked affixes again. Um, so this would be concatenative. And then nonlinear is where you get into um, more, like higher levels of fusion. So rather than having sort of affixes, suffixes, and prefixes, you actually change the form of the word itself. Often um, languages that have sort of an oplout where you're changing the vowel inside would be an example of nonlinear um, uh, inflection or derivation. So for example, in English, we have some uh, strong verbs where we have uh, situations like sing versus sang. And this would be an example of non-concatenative. We don't have like a suffix we're putting on. Typically we have a concatenative suffix ed that marks the past. But in sing and sang, it's non-linear. We have um, a, a change in the vowel. We, we have a change within the word itself that is telling you sort of the gr grammatical information. And in this case, it would be tense. It would be telling you that it's the past tense. Um, so languages that have consonantal roots, but sort of patterns of vowels around them, uh, like um, like the Semitic and Hamitic languages, uh, would be in this category of having a lot of nonlinear affixes, but they also tend to have some concatenative ones. So um, between nonlinear and concatenative is where like we want to be in terms of things. Like we can have affixes, like added suffixes or things like that, um, but they would be, they have a high exponents level. So yeah, low exponents level. I think I'm getting that wrong. Yeah, um, but we'll get to that. So this just means, so this is separate from the word, connected to the word, within the word itself. <laughs> like you're, you're changing the word, um, its form in some way, usually with vowels. Um, or like you, you know, you might have tone. Again, that's kind of mostly a vowel thing, but um, nonlinear. So that's the level of fusion. How fused to the word it are things? Separate, added to it, or within it. Um, so that's the, that's the fusion. And we kind of want to be in this range here. Maybe some concatenative things, some nonlinear things. So I'll say concat nonlinear for my... Um, I won't highlight, I'll just put my sort of answers over here. <laughs> for these. Um, next is flexivity. How flexive is it? So let me explain what that is. So this is how much change happens to the formative um, in the language. So for example, are there different forms of the same ending depending on gender? So um, with my noun class system, for example, uh, if you have an ending for like the dative case uh, that we were talking about earlier, there could be one form for, you know, class one concept nouns, whereas there's another one for class nine human nouns. So that would be an example of flex flexion, uh, flexivity. So that would be flexive. There would be lots of different forms for the same thing, um, depending on classes and things like that. Um, whereas non-flexive is, you know, the form for everything is the same. Um, so that's probably not what we're going to end up with, just because we want things to be compact, and we're probably going to have agreement. There could be some non-flexive things. Uh, for example, I don't imagine necessarily that verb endings are going to be super different, differentiated by verb class, because rather than doing verb classes, I'm kind of doing interesting things with the alignment. So instead of having like separate, um, you know, intransitive versus transitive versus ditransitive verbs, um, I'm kind of allowing the case system to take care of that. Um, and even doing like a thing with the experiencer, the data of experiencer to show different kinds of verbs rather than having different categories. I might still need some things for inchoative and causative and other other things I could do with verbs, but I'm probably going to get most of that across with noun morphology instead. I think that makes more sense in my brain um, to do it with the words themselves rather than, or like the nouns themselves rather than change the verb. Uh, so there might be some non-flexive affixes on the verbs, but most of the noun stuff is going to be flexive based on the noun class. So, mostly flexive, I'll say flexive, um, yeah. All right, 
Next is exponents. And this is where we get into what I really want out of the fusion. Um, because I even could, in theory, have isolating affixes, but have them have a cumulative exponents. I just don't want a separative exponents. And what this means is if exponents is cum cumulative, that means you have multiple like grammatical functions all taken up by a single formative. So I could have one ending that means, you know, secondary evidentiality, de, blah, 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 I can speak, secondary evidentiality, non-past realis. And the one ending means all three of those. So it'd be like that, like we were showing earlier, this particular box in the table would have a unique ending that means all of this information. Non-past, secondary, evidentiality, realis, mood. Um, that's, that's cumulative exponents. Separative would be more like an agglutinating language where there's those separate endings and they kind of stack with each other. Concatenatively or um, non-linearly. Like maybe you have like a root for the, the tense and then you have sort of vowel changes for the affix. So that would still be separative. It's just separated um, by what the morpheme is, but it's non-linear in that it's like mushed into it. So this is this is part of why the separation makes sense because you can have different kinds of fusion here. You could have it be fusional but still clearly separate morphemes. Like you could have a like a root template for one thing and then the non-linearly grafted into it other morpheme. That's still separate. They're still separate morphemes. Whereas it's cumulative, it's like a unique ending as opposed to um, you know multiple different endings like or, or prefixes or infixes or whatever pushed into each other. Now, I could, if I have a lot of nonlinear stuff, I could be fine with separative, and that might be easier to remember. Um, so, but I think the thing that makes the clearest sense is to just have it be leaning towards cumulative. I think I'm going to do a little tilde here again. Leaning towards cumulative but could have some separative things so long as they're non-linear and not taking up extra space. Um, that's kind of the main, keeping in line with the goal, the main sort of priority there is to not have it take up too much space. So that's where I'm kind of at with the typology is it's between concatenative and non-linear, so I could have some concatenative, you know, added on endings and some grafted into the word. I could have so I want it to be mostly flexive, mostly um, there's going to be different forms for the same ending, depending on what class it's in, for nouns at least, for verbs less so. Um, and then cumulative in that most of the endings are going to be a combination of things rather than sort of neatly separated out. And in terms of the overall synthesis, I'm not yet sure. If I'm leaning towards concatenative, nonlinear, and cumulative, then it's mostly going to be synthetic. But I could, down the line, decide that I actually want it to be more analytic and have more isolating stuff happening. It depends on how my, I think it's going to depend on my root shape and my um, phonology, which is its own discussion. That's going to come much later because I can't make those, de I can't make those decisions um, until I get there, <laughs> until I get through other grammar stuff. Or at least I don't want to make those decisions yet. So that's where we're at with typology. So that is typology done. Um, so we're at 708 Pacific. So we have some time to get into the next topic. Um, that topic being pronouns. So this kind of brings me back to the purpose of this language, um, especially in terms of goal and who it's for. Um, because Um, this language is meant to be mostly personal, at least useful for me, in my opinion, for writing about humanities and social sciences topics, particularly linguistics, philology, anthropology, and history. Um, so, the use of pronouns will mostly be in the context of 
um, anaphora back to existing nouns in the in the context, like if I'm talking about a person or a thing. Um, third person pronouns are going to be heavily used, and having different forms for the different classes would be probably a good idea. I could group some of these to not have to have, if I don't want 10 different third person pronouns, I could have, you know, I could group some of these together into like bigger categories that the pronouns could cover. Um, because it might not need to be that, that minute of detail for things, depending. Um, but I think, um, in general, I'm going to want more third person pronoun distinctions than others. I'm not going to use a lot of second person unless I am quoting what someone said in history. And I don't think that's going to need to have a lot of distinctions because mostly second persons are going to be humans. Um, maybe they could be non-humans, like and deities or concepts, but in general, they will be human, so I might not need to mark that there. I could just say, there's a second person who it refers to. Use your, use context and common sense there. Um, not common sense, uh, just context and the sense given to you in the context. Um, and then probably same for first person. It's mostly going to be humans and supernatural entities that are referring to themselves. Unless I'm talking about like maybe a myth. If I'm doing folklore, I might have animals speaking in like fables or something, or plants even, or places. Um, so it could be a little bit wider than that. Um, there are a lot of myths where substances speak, like the earth, like the sand spoke, or the, the rock spoke, or something like that. Um, so there could be some flexibility, but would I need to mark that with a gendered pronoun? Probably not. The context would make that clear. So I would only really need first and second persons um, to be pretty simple. So if I, sorry about the kind of clicking around, I was doing something with my fingers. Um, I probably will need a pronoun, a separate pronoun thing, just because I don't want to mess with the spacing of these, but I could just add a bunch more. I think I'll just add a bunch more um, columns instead. Um, this way, I'll scroll. Eventually I'll have all of this stuff looking nice and neat tables and stuff. This is just still planning, so it's going to be looking a little ugly. <laughs> so, um, just to throw something together over here, I need, so I'm going to have first person, second person, third person. Uh, so first person being, you know, myself, I, me, and then second person, you, third person, anyone else, you know, him, her, um, they, you know, it. And if I'm going by gender, I would have three different, or not three different, ten or less, um, ten or fewer gendered third person pronouns. So we'd have three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I don't know if the lag is making that not ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, let's merge that. And then I'm going to have my different classes. So we have concept, we have phenomenon, uh, we have uh, matter, we have a tool, we have, I can't remember if geographic or food is next, but let's do food next. Actually, I think geography is after food. Food, well, food, geography, um, Fauna. Wait, no. I got that backwards. Flora. <laughs> Fauna. Human. And supernatural. Right? That's that's all ten, right? Let's just check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Cool. And then first and second person don't need to care about the gender. Now we also have mass nouns and count nouns. So the default would be mass. So if we're talking about a collective of first and second persons, that would be we or us and you all, or like everyone whom I'm speaking to, respectively. So this would be like we, and this would be like y'all. Um, and then if we were going singulative, or for humans here, and then mass for a bunch of these except for the humans, um, then 
we would be doing count. Sorry, this would not be the squiggle. This would be default, and this will be count. So singulative. So it could be I, or it could be multiple of us. Some of us, but not all of us. Um, uh, and then we could have you singular, like thou, or you singular, or some of you. Um, and then, you know, you just kind of go down the line with these. So that gives us 10 times 2 is 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 total personal pronouns. 24 total personal pronouns. Um, and each of these has seven cases. So that's 24 times 7. Can I do that math in my head or am I going to use a calculator? I'm going to use a calculator because my head hurts. <laughs> Uh, 24 times 7 is 168 unique pronoun forms. So I would definitely want the declension of my nouns to be relatively predictable, If even if it's like cumulative and merged together. I want some patterns that are recognizable that may look a little bit agglutinative. So long as it's staying in the same syllable, I'd be probably fine. Um, because this is a little unfortunate, 168 pronouns, and it's not even all pronouns, it's just personal pronouns, it's not even getting into dictics. Oh, on that, on that note, do I want to merge my third persons with my, proc, uh, my, um, demonstratives? What is a demonstrative, and how specific of demonstratives do I need? So demonstrative pronouns are things like this, that, here, there, um, they're pointing to things. They're deictic pronouns. Uh, well, personal pronouns are also deictic. They're also pointing to specific speech act participants. But um, with demonstratives, you're like sort of pointing to a relative thing, a relative person or thing or place or, or even time. Um, and demonstratives, uh, there's some different ways to do that. We could just have a plain demonstrative that means this or that, like just contextual thing that matters. Um, and if it's an actual actor in the, um, in the sentence, if it has a role, it's like it's actually a pronoun, I could just use third person pronouns like him or her or it and have it be the topic to say like that thing that's topical is, you know, that food is blah, 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 and have my sentence because I'm marking topic. So I could just use third person pronouns and use the topic marking to get that across. <laughs> Um, or I could go really far in and have a lot of different distinctions. So I could have proximate. That would be things like this, here, um, thus, now, if we're talking about time. Um, and I could have distal, which is like over there, that, yonder, um, or then, in that far away time, or something like that. And English nowadays is mostly proximal distal, but we used to have a medial as well. And that was actually medial, and distal was yonder. Um, yonder is kind of rare now. So we have like close to me, the speaker, or like most relevant to the topic, kind of less relevant, or close to you, the listener, or just like med middle distance. And then we have far distance. Um, and this is the system I believe Japanese has. This is also the system. Um, Formal written Italian and Tuscan Italian has. Um, most spoken dialects of Italian just have proximal distal. Um, but um, Tuscan, at least, still differentiates the, the medial. Um, so um, I could do something like that. But again, I already have, if I do this, I have 168 unique forms for um, personal pronouns. That's 24 times the seven cases. If I'm adding three more, I feel like these would also need to mark the gender because they're referring back like this what this tool this food this this place um this this person um yeah i think it gets super redundant to have a third person human but also have a proximal human i think this human is he or she or they um you know, th that is this human. So I think third person is pr is uh, demonstrative. And I don't feel like I necessarily really want a lot of distinctions between, like, this versus that. 
I don't find it super useful in a lot of my writing. I tend to go back and forth whether or not I'm going to use this versus that in my own writing a lot of the time. Um, so I think I'm just going to have third person sensitive demonstratives be the same. Now the thing that gets tricky with uh, third persons versus demonstratives, if you have them merged, the issue you get is uh, whether you're... So demonstratives can function as pronouns, right? They're replacing a noun. Um, they're standing into or like really referring back to it. Or they can function as determiners, like a, sort of what articles in English to like the or a. Uh, we also use demonstratives for this. So you could say, um, I really like pizza. Um, or mm -hmm, I'm going to think of a better example. Um, uh, I, I dropped a vase and it broke. This is a problem. So this and this is a problem is a pronoun. It refers back to the situation. So in this language, that would probably be like a concept. The concept of me breaking or like dropping a vase would be a concept. So it would be like this concept. So it would be third person demonstrative concept count probably. Well, with concepts, I think the default will be mass. So like just the general situation. We'll just be like, it's not a countable situation. You can't, you can't have multiple me dropping the bases. I mean, you could, but um, I think in general, we might end up with some situations where the things might be merged, which would also reduce the number of pronouns we have. Um, I, I do want to think about whether or not I want all of my um, noun classes to make this number distinction productively, um, like just generally. It would apply to all of them. I, I want to think more about that before I make that decision. But um, let's say I did that. The this there is a pronoun. So it's referring back to the concept of me dropping. So this is a problem. This situation is a problem. But I could instead say this situation is a problem. And where this so situation is my concept noun. And this is just a determiner. It's just saying which, which situation? Oh, this one. The one I'm referring back to. And that this would still be a concept. But it's not... A pronoun anymore. It's um, it's sort of more like an adjective. It's an article describing the noun uh, rather than replacing it. Now, a lot of the time, I won't need to say that. I won't need that kind of an article because in context, I could just say situation is problem and make the situation the topic. Um, or situation is already marked for concept. Um, so that would be fine a lot of the time. Um, but if I wanted these to be determiners, there's the problem with this situation um, versus like this concepts situation genitive. So if it's a possessive, that could be a problem. Um, it's more clear when there's people. So like I could say this person or, you know, she, this person is, um, say, oh, this person's book, like her book is, um, really fascinating. So her describes the book. So I would use probably the dative because it's an inalienable possessor. So it'd be like the book to her, like the book for her, her book is fascinating. But the problem is if it's also a demonstrative, it's like, um, the book, um, the book that is, like, for her, the book of which she is the recipient, is fascinating. The book that's for her. But actually, I feel like that's not really an inherent problem with having it be a demonstrative. I think that's more of a problem of just the dative's vagueness, um, which I don't mind. I don't actually mind the ambiguity. If the book is hers, it is for her. Um, and whether or not her being it being for her is the point, it just depends on what's the topic. So I think that's probably fine. Um, I don't think I have the typical problem I do with third person and demonstrative merging because 
um, I have so many noun classes, so that actually doesn't present a problem. So this is fine. Yeah, the demonstrative and the third person can be the same. That's perfectly fine. Now, other pronouns would be things like, um, and I wouldn't even really need a word for like here or there because geography, uh, this place, like place in question is nice. I want to say something is here. Uh, I could say like third person place and put it in the locative case is located at this place. It is here. It's located at place that is what we're talking about. Um, exactly. So that's perfectly fine. I could totally do that. So that still leaves us with 168 pronoun forms. Um, so I might still think about merging some of the numbers here or not marking number in third person demonstratives. That's a pretty common thing languages might do. Or because the antecedent will mark the number probably like what, what thing it's referring back to would have the number marked on it, so then I don't need to say. Like, I don't need, like, a they versus, like, a singular they versus plural they, or a singular he versus plural they. I've already said that it's a count person, and there's one of them, so I would just say, like, they, and it would refer back to that one person. Um, I'm not marking, like, gender of person here. <laughs> the, the human is the gender. <laughs> um, there's not, like, a... I'm not having separate forms for what gender in the culture there. Um, and that's that's kind of deliberate. Um, part of it is because my gender system is based on what kind of noun it is rather than like what category of human gender I have here. Um, but the other reason is because I'm talking about anthropology and I'm going to be talking about a lot of different cultures. Different cultures have different const constructs of gender and I wouldn't want to grammatically impose that on whatever culture I'm describing um, with having like a built-in human gender like you know, masculine, feminine, something like that. I wouldn't want to be imposing that on whatever culture I'm describing. I'm just going to have human be the gender for humans. And then if there are specific genders, I would just have words for those that I use. Um, and I wouldn't need to use them when referring to people as pronouns. Um, so that's demonstrative pronouns, third person and demonstratives, and that works fine. Um, this person would be like him or her or she, like they or anyone. And then this animal would be the animal in question, or this food uh, would be it, or this tool would be it, you know? Um, so that works great, actually, for this language. Um, I'll think more about what I can merge, though, um, between now and next time. Uh, so the next time will be Saturday. And then, um, let's see, the other kind of pronoun I was thinking about is, and there's something I've been doing in a lot of conlangs recently, and I think I'm doing it because I think it's very efficient, is I'm merging indefinite pronouns with um, with interrogative pronouns. So an interrogative, well, I might not actually merge this, though. Um, an interrogative pronoun is a question, usually what we call WH questions, although not all of them in English have WH. Uh, who, what, when, where, why, when, or I already said when, uh, how, how much, how many, in what way, all that kind of stuff is... Uh, demonstrative and um, or not demonstrative sorry interrogative so it marks questions um, but they can also be relative pronouns so you could say like in English at least WH questions can also be not questions they can be relative pronouns so you could say like this is the place where I eat so there where isn't a question it's um, a relative pronoun it's saying the place in which I eat so we're using where and and the other one, I said in which. So in this language, I would probably say I'd have an indefinite pronoun um, that is marked for location gender, like geographical noun class. And if I want to say the place in which I eat, it would probably be marked for location as well. So it would be a, a geographical noun and in the locative case. Um, and then have my like irrealis verb where it says eat. Or it would probably be realis um, that says eat, I eat. Um, that would be how I would say that. Um, but my thing I'm wondering about, oh, and then if I want it to be indefinite, that could be like whoever, whatever, anyone, any place, anything. That's indefinite. Um, I tend to also have distributives go into that category. So like each, um, that kind of thing. The reason I tend to have those together Together is because most of the languages I've done recently have marked explicitly whether or not something is a question. And if something is not a question, 
it can be clear that the wh word you're using is indefinite. Um, I, I tend not to have them be relative. I use other things for the relative pronouns. Um, now, what I'm wondering is if I even need relative pronouns in this language. Because I think I could use demonstratives and mark them for case. And then have the verb describe the demonstrative. Um, I'll think more about that when I talk about syntax again. When I go back to syntax, I think I'm scheduled to go back to syntax soon. Um, if not, I'm going to throw it in there because I think it definitely needs... Yeah, adjective clauses, noun clauses. Yeah, I'm going to talk about syntax soon um, after I talk about adjectives in general. Um, so I think uh, I don't need to worry about relative pronouns. I'll think about that more when I talk about adjectives and just clauses in general when I go back to syntax. Uh, but whether or not I need interrogatives is also a question I have. Um, I think I probably do. But I'm wondering if it would be more efficient, even though it would take more space. I wonder if it would be more efficient to just have a marker that transforms my demonstratives into indefinite or interrogative and have it be the same thing. Uh, just, again, to be efficient. Um, I don't have an explicit question marker in this language. Um, a lot of my questions will be... Well, actually, I might just not have an explicit question marker here, and since it's mostly going to be written, I'll have a question mark. Or I could have a question marker. We'll see. Um, I haven't decided that yet. It's definitely not marked on the verb, but I could have maybe, even though it's maybe another syllable or another another sound that's less compact, I could have a question marker. But I could also put whatever it is, or have a different marker, onto the demonstratives to turn them into questions, um, or indefinite. So I could have human, I could have demonstrative human, so like, singulative demonstrative human, and that could be, like, that person, or like, she, or he, or they. And if I add some kind of wh word marker, something that indicates that it's indefinite or interrogative, it could mean whichever person, or if it's explicitly a question, it would mean who. I mean, which person? Who? Um, whereas if I put it on maybe a place, I could say like that place there, or this place here, a uh, place in question. I could say geographic noun, or geographic pronoun marker that's interrogative, and say that would mean where, in what lo like in what place. Um, it could also, if I put on phenomena, it could be in what situation, in what time, potentially. Um, and then these things could be marked for the appropriate cases, like until what time, that would be marked for dative. Since what time, that would be ablative. During what time, that would be locative, because I'm using locative for time as well. Um, so uh, that could be very efficient if I just have like a WH marker, and that could be, I'll say interrog slash indef and just make sure that I make the sentence in some way indicate whether it's a question or not to differentiate those two things. And I would just like one interrogative or indefinite marker. So I'm going to merge those um, cells. So it's going to be something. And I'll figure out also what, what I want to merge here um, as well. Um, between now and next time. So that is uh, pronouns. And of course, I'm also going to need to think about what cases they will take. Because it's 168 if we don't count the indefinite ones as separate, because they're just they're just like an extra thing added to the third person of demonstrative. Um, so I'm still going to call it 168. If we have all these different forms for them, the unmarked form and then all the marked forms for all 24 plus prefix versions of the other 10 or 20. Um, again, if we have 20 third persons, I might have fewer if I merge some of the numbers. Um, or if I have fewer classes, if I think more about that. But if I do this, um, I would probably also want to think through the ramifications of having every case for every noun, because I feel like there are some where it won't make as much sense to have every case for every pronoun. Um, for example, I might find that maybe humans might want to differentiate, like, data versus um, ablative for, like, alienable possession. But I could just have, like, ablative and locative be the same for some pronouns, maybe. Um, 
I don't know, maybe with a phenomenon and from a phenomenon could be the same thing. But I'm, I would probably say no to that particular example because from a time versus during a time would be different. And I would like that to be specific. Um, but I might find that there are some things that I'm more happy with merging in certain genders than others. I would also, though, want it to be, like, make sense in my brain. <laughs> like, be easy to remember what is the same and what is different. So I might shy away from that and just have these be pretty regular in how they mark things across the genders. Now, when I, we think about how many forms we're going to have, what I did is I made a declension table that we'll come back to when we do noun declension. Um, and what this shows is there are 20 columns here times 7 cases. So that is um, uh, 140 different endings here. I think I did that math right. 20 times 7 is 140. Um, different endings for noun. So like these are the thing. I keep saying endings. There's a reason why I keep saying endings. That's sort of like where affixes tend to go if we're inflecting things they tend to go in the end in a lot of languages uh, not all languages of course um i just tend to say endings because the languages that i work with tend to have endings but when i say endings i just mean markings for these cases and numbers so we have the collective and singulative is how i chose to abbreviate them they're mass and count for a lot of things too but these are established sort of linguistic abbreviations that exist there aren't really established ones for mass and count that i know of um, so I just went with collective singulative. I would just call it mass and count when we're in mass and count things, like things that make sense for that, like phenomena or foods uh, will tend to be mass and count. So yeah, that's where we are. Um, now, oh, I think I got the order wrong. It's tool, geography, food. Is that what I put for the pronouns? Tool, food, geography. Yeah. Tool, Geography, food. Um, there's a reason I care about the order. We'll talk about it later. Um, I might just choose to have it be arbitrary, though. I might have it not matter, and in which case, I'm just trying to be consistent with my lists here. Um, but, yeah. Um... The point I was trying to make is that there are going to be a lot of forms for the different gender plus noun class plus number plus patient agent um, data, like case endings. Um, so, yeah, 140 at least. Now, I'm fine with some of these being the same. Like maybe the the located in a concept and located in a phenomenon might be the same and like maybe even located in matter. Or... A tool and a food used instrument instrumentally might have the same ending or something like that. I might, as things are similar to each other, I might reorder these columns and therefore change what order the classes are in. Because right now, again, it's arbitrary. It's just kind of like what I thought of. And the order is sort of like increasing in animacy. And we'll talk about animacy another day. But um, in my view, at least. But... Um, We'll talk more about that, but I, I, I've I will probably rearrange things as we make whatever the um, affixes are, so that if there's overlap, I can kind of merge the cells and see visually what is similar and what is different. Um, so that will be kind of a fun exercise, I think, when we get to it. Um, but yeah, so it is. We're like eight minutes past when I planned it to end the stream. Uh, when I planned to end the stream, I don't know why I double pass marked that. Um, so. We did pronouns, at least figured out what general system we'll have. I'll tweak it some more um, between now and next time. So what we got done on the agenda uh, was, let's go back to it and see. We got typology and we got pronouns. So next time I'm going to talk about like the adjective questions that are coming up. So I have a few different things regarding adjectives that I want to think about, like do they exist in this language? Um, are, what are adjectives? How do, how do they work? Do they work like nouns? Do they work like verbs? Do they work like their own thing? I imagine I want some kind of agreement with the um, noun classes to some extent. Although at the same time, I imagine reasons why I might want them to behave more verb-like. Um, and I'll talk about that 
on Saturday during the next stream. So I'm going to end the stream around here. Um, and just before I leave, I want to remind everyone when the next stream is. So I have updated my Twitch schedule um, since I said I would last time, and I, I did. I did the thing. Um, so you will see it says that on Thursdays and Saturdays is when we have Conling with me. So that is what you're currently watching. And on Thursdays, it goes from 5 to 7.30 Pacific. Um, so it'll be localized to whatever your time is if you're looking at the um, schedule. Um, now, if... Uh, so that's Thursdays. Um, Thursday schedule. Um, now, if you uh, go to... Uh, the other con link with me, which is Saturday. On Saturdays, we've got a different t sort of time slot that this is. I'm just trying to see if I can open up when that is. Um, my phone is not being particularly kind to me right now in terms of trying to get that open. Uh, so apologies, I'm trying to remember when it is. Um, uh, it's not letting me look at my schedule for some reason. Why is it not letting me look at my schedule? I should be able to just see my schedule. That should be relatively intuitive, but for some reason it is not. Um, let's see here. Apologies. Um, I'm just going to do this on desktop because I do not know how to find my schedule on mobile. Um, All right. Um, thank you, everyone who's in in chat right now, uh, sticking by me <laughs> while I fumble through um, telling you when the next broadcast is going to be. If you haven't looked at the uh, schedule, um, hello. Let's see here. Why is this so complicated? Go to creator dashboard. Thank you. That's where it's going to be. I am very new to Twitch, so <laughs> thank you for bearing with me. Um, let's go to settings. Should be in settings, and then channel, and then schedule should be right there. Yes. So today uh, we have Con Lang with me, and it's five thirty to or five to seven thirty p.m. Pacific. So whatever that is in your time zone, um, and then. Uh, the next con lane with me is Saturday. So it's Thursdays and Saturdays we have con lane with me. And Saturday con lane with me is much longer because I have more time on Saturday. Um, it's 3.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific. Um, so much longer. And on Fridays, actually, uh, tomorrow, there is also going to be a string, but it's going to be a bit different. It is called Yester Lore. And in Yester Lore, I'm going to just be doing kind of random different things where I look at ancient and medieval text and talk about them, do fun things with them, and that is going to be more of a, um, hopefully more interactive, or at least um, there's going to be more audience participation, hopefully, uh, with that. Not that there has to be, but I hope for it, uh, because we're going to be looking at some old texts and um, talking about them, asking questions, explaining some things, and for the first one, we are going to be looking at um, the Exeter book which is a um, document that is written in Old English. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the history of the Exeter book. And we're particularly going to be looking at the riddles in the Exeter book. And uh, we're going to look at the manuscript, and I'm going to um, read some riddles in Old English. And, of course, I will kind of interpret them for people in the audience. And we'll hopefully uh, be able to try to solve the riddles. So... Um, they'll give us sort of hints or describe the riddle, and we'll try to solve the riddle. Um, so if you want to participate in the game, you would not want to be looking at the answers, because the answers do exist. They're out there. Um, scholars have kind of determined what the answers probably are. Um, we can't know for sure, because we're not there. But we'll read riddles in Old English, uh, which should be fun. 
it's going to be kind of a just sort of around the campfire reading and talking kind of vibe. That's that's what Yesterlor will be. So we'll be doing different ancient and medieval texts every week. Um, and that is from 5.30 to 8 p.m. Pacific um, Fridays. So that is all on my schedule on Twitch if you go to my channel. Now, one last update before I leave. I know we're like 15 minutes over time already. But um, I will be like uploading the recordings of the this session and the prior session um, as well as future sessions to a YouTube channel just so that they're like up um, indefinitely <laughs> um, until I decide to take them down if I ever do. Um, just so people can look at the backlog if they're joining later in this sort of conlang with me series. Um, also, oh, there was one other question that I didn't put on because it didn't really fit into um, what I was describing at the beginning, but I did have a question of, is this the only conlang I'm going to make in conlang with me? Um, I'm just going to keep doing conlang with me <laughs> um, until it I no longer want to. So if, if we get to a point where I feel like we've finished this conlang and... I feel like I still want to do Conley with me. I might start a new Conley. I might even have people in the chat suggest um, some ideas for a new Conley. And we can maybe even collaboratively work on something like that. Um, uh, but I would like to just mostly focus on this first Conley and get this out of the way before I make that kind of a decision. Um, uh, so, yes, that is the end of the stream. <laughs> Thank you for everyone who showed up. And anyone in the future who's watching the backlog of this, uh, thank you for putting up with this very long um, uh, rambly session as I'm still kind of getting used to using Twitch. Um, so thank you. And I hope everyone has a lovely evening or afternoon or morning, wherever it is in whatever time zone you're in or whenever you happen to be watching this. Um, and thank you. Good night, everyone.